Aggressive faith unlocks the impossible. Aggressive faith. Boring faith won't do it. Ordinary faith won't do it. Religious faith, kick that out. We need Holy Ghost faith that breaks down the shackles of the ordinary and awakens the hungry hearts of men and women in our world because I want to tell you we have a desperate world out there that's looking for answers. And the only answers we've really got is the answers that are found in this book. It's called The Power of Faith. Let's get into what God wants to say to us and let's believe God today is our day for miracles breaking through in our lives, all right? So we speak to the atmosphere. I cause the atmosphere to shift into a place that's conducive right now to the power of God. Port Moresby, that your atmosphere is conducive right now. Whoever that was in here today or we prayed for you before with leukemia, God is the healer. He can bust the curse of sickness, disease and cancer over your life. He can take away if you're paralyzed or in pain this morning. Pain can dissipate in this meeting. We're not waiting for an altar call as it were but as we preach God's word I believe that our faith lifts to a place of expectation and we can receive a miracle right where you are. In fact we should be miracle carriers. I just said we should be miracle carriers okay. In Psalm 107 and verse 20, it says, He sent His word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. It's a powerful verse. He sent His word. Jesus came so that we could be free of sickness, disease, depression, brain problems, mental issues, that we could live in the freedom that Jesus won for us on Calvary. And I want to tell you today, we can walk into that. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, it says, We walk by faith, not by sight. So many times we're caught up with what's around us that we stop walking with our eyes fixed in the right place. That's why I say let's lift up the Word of God today and let's live by the Word of God instead of living by our feelings or our circumstances or the issues that we face or what the TV news would present to us. In fact, I would recommend that you don't watch it because you'll get the best news out of here of what the end is and how it all wraps up anyway. And we will. Hallelujah. We win and we need to know a little bit of that. We need to know that we are on the winning side, okay? Matthew chapter 19 and verse 26, the Bible says, With man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. All things, come on, all things are possible. Not a few things, but all things are possible. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, it says, Without faith. So if you don't have faith, and I believe we all have faith, I believe we fail to activate our faith. I think sometimes we rest. It gets pretty cruisy in churches. You can be there and just chill on by, but I believe God wants us to activate faith. And I I think this whole series actually is because of me. We're starting off today, nothing is impossible, okay? That's why I've turned up. Nothing is impossible. You're looking at a walking, living miracle today. And miracles, incidentally, they don't all happen like snap of the fingers. You've got to walk into your miracle. You've got to keep going in your miracle. You've got to walk through the pain sometimes, through the disappointment sometimes. In fact, I'll drink to that. Such a good thought. But you have got to hold on to what God's truth in your, is in your life, okay? So if I were to ask you a question today, and have you ever faced a situation that you would consider impossible to you or looks like you could never overcome that situation? Many of us come up with these situ- situations and it cancels people out. I know we live in a cancel culture, but we don't have a cancel God. We have a God with whom all things is possible. And so we can walk through the difficulties in life. Julia and I have had to learn what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. We've had to understand and come to the realization that faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. And I think we have weak faith so often because it's never faced the test of time or the test of courage. And I think faith that can't be tested, I don't want to trust it. I want some people that have gone through some battles, that have fought some fights, the fight of faith, and come out the other side and still excited. That have fought for their marriages, fought for their lives, fought for their children, fought for the kingdom of God, and we come out the other side still excited about what we're doing right now. Amen? 
Man, I'm 70 years old, more excited than half of you 30-year-olds in the place. Come on, we've got to get excited. I feel as excited as two 35-year-olds today, and I'm ready to go. The problem is we get there, and we get, we get kind of half-hearted about it. We think, ho-hum, this is it. But, hey, we've got a life to live. We've got a God who has an anointing on you and a calling on you, and we've got a whole nation in Australia that needs to hear the gospel a nation that needs salvation, and I would stir you up. So sometimes those hard things can pull us down. But I want to remind you today that no challenge is too big. No challenge is too big for my God. He can set you free. He can break chains. No situation is too tough. God is bigger than what you're going through right now. And we have lived to prove that. And I think some of the things we've walked through, I I wouldn't wish on anybody in the world, but things we've walked through that we've had to believe that all you've got to hang on to is God. If you've done some ministry in Vietnam, like I've been to Vietnam, I think 57 times now, 57 times when we first started ministering in Vietnam, I think we've planted like something like out of the Bible school and stuff we've done there, we planted something like 100 churches in Vietnam. And so God's transforming that nation. And it happens one day at a time. You know, we want a miracle where it's like the whole nation's happening today, but you've got to walk through some stuff. And I tell you right now, I remember when I used to take people and we used to go walking through the streets of Vietnam and the, the, the Viet Cong would be spying on you. Sometimes they'd have the newspaper up with a little camera looking at you through the hole in the newspaper. I used to like going up to the newspaper and taking a photo of them, the hole in the newspaper. And, uh, but we've preached all over Vietnam. We've been arrested. We've been chased by police. A little while ago, I sat down with a young guy who was a, a youth leader in Vietnam. And uh, he had no fingernails. And he told me how he had just been through intense interrogation and torture to, to give up names and positions and all sorts of stuff. And here he was still fired up about the gospel of Christ. We think we've been through a battle sometimes. Guys, we haven't even started. We haven't even started. When you've sat down with men who have been buried alive for four days and dragged out of there, and they're still excited about the God whom they serve, they won't give up for anything. And I think sometimes we need to learn. Our God is a God of the impossible. He can break you through. He can bring you through. He took Daniel through a den of lions. He can take you through a fire and bring you out the other side unscathed. And we've got to hold on to this truth because I believe it's the answer for life today for every one of us. And when you sit down with these guys. Honestly, you cannot but get excited and passionate. Sometimes I feel unworthy. I feel like, man, have we really, have we, would we, would we last? Would we persevere? Would we keep going? A little while ago, I was was actually detained in a meeting, detained and, and uh, taken into custody. Um, Hardly like saying it online, actually, in case it gets to them, but by the Viet Cong and interrogated by, by the Minister of Police, the Minister of Immigration, the Minister of, of um, Foreign Affairs, all these high, high noters who are just ordinary people like you and I, worried about their own situations, battling their own battles and uh, thinking they don't like the gospel and I remember sitting down and I was getting interrogated by them. It was quite a confusing sort of a thing. They just called me McDonnell and McDonnell, what are you doing in our nation? And I'm here. I said, I'm here because I love the Vietnamese people. I've been here. I said, they said, how many times you've been here? Actually, I think I said, I said, I think I've been here 47 times. They said, we would like to correct that. You have been here 53 times. And we've noted every single time you've crossed our border. People are watching you. You can't live a half-hearted life. People are watching you. Nothing annoys me worse than when I have a preacher come to our church and he's on the front row and he's like looking as boring as and just sitting there while we're worshiping God and getting excited about the thing. Then he gets up here and tells me to get excited about his preaching. We've got to be excited just being in church. Wherever you're sitting, you should be excited. It's not about the platform. It's about living a life. And I want to tell you when I'm with these, these uh, Viet Cong governmental leaders being interrogated. God gives me a word of knowledge for the minister of police about his son and how his son, who's right now battling with cocaine and addicted to cocaine, and how I'm in Vietnam. They said, what are you here for? I'm here to see 
young men set free from oppression and addiction and see this nation become loved by God. And next thing I see tears in the minister of police is not in, in his eyes. And he starts telling me it's his son who's like that. And I said, well, we can see your son set free. We got the power to break the captivating force of addiction. Jesus is the answer. And I want and, and, and this is what they said to me. McDonnell, we're going to give you authority to preach anywhere you want to preach in Vietnam. Right now, I've got the Minister of Police's phone number. I can go anywhere in that nation. We've just had like 10,000 people at a conference and had people here. They've been bringing ambulances to our conference with dead people in the back and dead people have been getting out and walking in Jesus' name. And I want to tell you, we have a God who is the God of the impossible. And even though the nation's closed, and we're not far from in our own Western world, actually, we're probably, we're getting more like, these communist nations, we're shutting down the gospel in schools and stuff. Don't let that hinder you. Just keep on believing. Keep on believing. Right now, we're getting into schools in Vietnam. We're getting the gospel into the nation. And I want to tell you, if you'll just keep pressing through, God can do anything. He wants to love and save the whole world. Amen. Let's go to a scripture this morning. I want to take you to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And um, we're going to just power into the word right there. The title of my message is Aggressive Faith, okay? Aggressive faith unlocks the impossible. Aggressive faith. Boring faith won't do it. Ordinary faith won't do it. Religious faith, kick that out. We need Holy Ghost faith that breaks down the shackles of the ordinary and awakens the hungry hearts of men and women in our world because I want to tell you we have a desperate world out there that's looking for answers. And the only answers we've really got is the answers that are found in this book. It's called The Power of Faith. So I want to preach about an aggressive faith that unlocks the impossible in your life, okay? Hebrews chapter 12 and verse six, verse 2 sorry, says this, Looking unto Jesus. Let's yell that out today. Come on. Because you can start looking at a lot of things. You can start looking at the news. God help you if you are looking at the news, incidentally. I refuse to watch it. Smith Wigglesworth, a man on fire with the Holy Ghost. Lester Summerall turned up at his house one day, had a newspaper back in the day before we had crazy stuff on TV. Lester Summerall turns up. He's hungry. You've got to live hungry. Lester Summerall wants to be a revivalist. He wants to take the gospel. He wants to go with the power of God. He turns up at Smith Wigglesworth's house. He's got a newspaper tucked under his arm. He knocks on the door and Smith comes out. He says, you can come in, but leave that rubbish outside. That will destroy the destiny of God that's on my life and on my area and on my purpose. And Lester went in, dropped the newspaper at the front door, goes in, receives an anointing from Smith Wigglesworth and goes out and starts a revival in the Philippines that's still going today and there are thousands across the planet because Smith Wigglesworth said don't let that garbage uh, infiltrate what God wants to do in your world looking unto Jesus guys come on he is the author and the finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God yeehaw if you're not going to get excited, I will, okay? Aggressive faith. It takes, you've got to be fixing your eyes on Jesus Christ, okay? Jesus, he sees us today. He saw you. He brought you with the price of his own son hanging on the cross so that we could live in the victory that Jesus won for us. And I want to live in that victory. I want to rise up in that victory. A.B. Simpson gave this incredible quote. I've just read a book of his about revival. He said this, our God has boundless resources. The only limit is in us. The only limit is in us, friends. Our asking, our thinking, and our praying are too small. Our expectations are too limited. Sometimes our limited expectations can stop what God wants to do in a life. My point there would be that expectation, expectation is the breeding ground for the miraculous. Expectation is the breeding ground for breakthrough in your life. Miracles happen when we get expectant. I stayed in, in a hotel some time ago now, but I stayed in a hotel uh, with my youth pastor and, and, you know, youth pastors, Levi, Hazel sitting on the front row, 
youth pastors like their sleep. And so I had my youth pastor with me. We'd, we'd traveled here to Australia to go to a conference. Actually, we got here late and uh, we kind of missed. In fact, it was a sort of a last minute decision. I thought I'd bring my youth pastor. And we got the only hotel that was left was like one of your Aussie sort of grade two. It was a disaster, actually. And uh, it literally had cockroaches in it, okay? And I am terrified, ask my wife, I'm terrified of bugs. I don't know. The only fear I have in the world, actually, is bugs. Spiders in Australia are allowed to be scared of spiders. And uh, so we're in there. It was kind of a depressing room, to be honest with you. We shared the room. Uh, he was, I said to him in the morning, we've got to get up and go, man. Come on, I was up there, like walking back and forth in the room. Shandala bushukuyanda, shapada bushupiriyanda, which interpreter would mean get out of here, you cockroaches. We're taking possession of this room. And, uh, and uh, just getting excited in God, really. And uh, we're trying to wake him up, by the way, trying to wake him up, shaking him, nothing's happening. And he's a youth pastor. And uh, so I'm ready to go. I said, see you later. I'm off to breakfast. And I'm walking down. I'm walking down the, the because you've got to fill yourself up with expectations. Somehow we've got to live with more than normal. We've got to live above the bar. We've got to fix our eyes above the circumstances. I think the only way we get expectations for the miraculous is when we leave behind the stuff, the negative confessions, the complaining, the the, the habits of critical spirit and leave those behind. Don't criticize the cockroaches. Live above them. Get excited about the day that's ahead of you and the opportunities that are in that day. And as I was walking down the hallway, I always live a little bit of competitive spirit and I'm walking down the hallway. And as I'm walking down the hallway, I see a couple coming the opposite way. And my thing is always to beat them to the elevator. And so I managed to beat them. I arrived at the elevator before they did. As I arrived there, um, uh, God gives me this amazing, just out of the blue, God says, tell them this is going to be the best day of their life. And uh, I mean, they didn't look like they were about to have the best day. I just said, well, this is going to be the best day of your life. And uh, welcome to my elevator. And we get in the elevator and we're in the elevator. And I said, you know what? And I just felt God's love for this couple. And uh, I said to them, you know what? I'm coming to breakfast with you guys. God wants to do a miracle in your lives today. And uh, it was kind of seriously, like, imagine that happening in an elevator. Most of us stand there like this, looking at the door, saying nothing. But uh, they couldn't believe that this person spoke in an elevator. And uh, so I kind of invited myself to breakfast with them. We sat down to breakfast. And uh, when we got there, I shared my story with them. And uh, I said, I don't know why it is, but God's told me to tell you this because I believe you need a miracle. It turned out, she said, how did you even know? But I have been suffering from that disease, leukemia, uh, cancer, cancer of the bone marrow. And she said, I'm down here because they've told me I'm going to die and I'm down here to see what treatment we can get. And I said, well, we've met by a divine appointment in an elevator. And I, I said, right now, why don't we talk about the power of God, how it can set you free? Because if he's a God of the impossible, it's not just in church. It's in the streets. It's everywhere we go. He's not just a God of the impossible when we're hanging out with Christian people. I think he wants to be the God of the impossible when we're hanging out with the most desperate people on earth. Anyway, I said that to her. And uh, anyway, I ended up praying. They ended up giving their lives to Christ right there at the table, actually. I, I, I led them and they prayed a prayer and surrendered their lives to Christ. And then I said, well, look, I'd love to pray for your leukemia. I believe God can heal you. And uh, I said, could we like might be awkward. I said, have you got any perfume in your room? We need oil. We need oil to anoint you. And he, she said, well, I've got some perfume. I said, that'll do. Let's go get your perfume. So we anointed her with her own perfume. And then we prayed a miracle prayer. Um, six months later, I got a, a email. And sometimes, you know, you get these emails. Um, Dear Don, this is Karen. And so sometimes those emails are not good to open. And, uh, and, uh, I opened it up and, and uh, this, these were the words without going to it. She said, thank you for being the strangest man I have ever met. <laughs> then she went through, she said, you got in the elevator and told us this was going to be the best of our lives and I was on my way to a death sentence. She said, yet you shifted the atmosphere. 
She said, something happened when we sat down and ate breakfast with you and you shared the testimony of how you were paralyzed from the neck down and your God healed you. And then you led us to Jesus and we gave our lives to Christ and got born again. Then you invited yourself to our room, which seemed weird, but you came to our room and, and in our room you anointed me with my own perfume. And I'm writing to you today to tell you that your God is real, that right now I'm involved in a Pentecostal church and I am totally free from leukemia. He is the God of the impossible. But I want to tell you, I believe he's looking for someone to get the edge on the devil. See, the devil's got most of us pinned down with depression and, and mind issues and thinking issues. But I like it when you can get out of bed in the morning and your first foot hits the ground and the devil freaks out. The second foot hits the ground and he's like, look out, he's up again. And we need to be living that life. So the devil is terrified of what the anointing is that we carry that can change a world and set captives free and bring liberty to the captives in Jesus' name. This is, not a, this is not three points in a poem, friends. In fact, forget your points. I think we need a flourishing anointing of the Holy Ghost that unlocks something in our lives that we can start to live the stuff we talk about. In Hebrews eleven six, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone that comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Are we seeking God? Are we hungry enough to go after God this morning? Are we desperate enough to see God unlock the supernatural in our lives? How's that working for you, Port Moresby? Come on, killer, I believe you've got an anointing on you to bring transformation to that part of our world. And I want to challenge you right now, this is not just a screen play. This is an anointed impartation to you right there in Port Moresby. Get ready for miracles to be unlocked in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I'm just going to give you a couple of thoughts as we close, all right? And my first thought is going to be, you've got to, if you want to see the impossible, look at the church. Fix your eyes on the church. The church is the representation of the life of Jesus Christ. It's the church of the living God. Jesus hung on the cross. He died for us right there. The Bible says that they've plunged a spear into his right side. I think it was the right side. Amen. That's where us guys came from. Oh, sorry, your woman came from. Same, same place where the rivers. Your girls came from there. Get excited, ladies. That's where your girls came from. And, and, and then Jesus is hanging on the cross. The second Adam is hanging on the cross and they thrust a spear into his right side. And the Bible says very clearly, out of his side flow, flowed forth blood and water. Blood and water, you'll only see them in a couple of places. Every birth, there's blood and water. That what flowed out of his side that day was the birth of the church of Jesus Christ. And we're a part of it today. And it's a miracle, empty cross, empty tomb. Jesus didn't stay there. He rose again from the dead. And I want to tell you, if you're not excited about the impossible, today you can just catch a glimpse of Jesus, his resurrection power, and you can live in the victory that he won for you right there, okay? So the church is the answer. And I think we need reminding of that sometimes. Isaiah 60. He says, arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. I know it's dark out there. I know it's dark. If you're watching TV or the news, you've got to know it's dark out there. Our world seems to have lost its way. It seems like there's zero common sense left on the planet. Common sense has gone out there. We've, we've got all the common sense right here. In the church, the church is the most common sense, Holy Ghost inspired place on earth. It's a family of God. And in here today, you are in the best environment you can ever get for the impossible to be unlocked in your life. It's called the church of the living God. And if you're here today, you're here for a reason that God wants to inspire you, that you're in the best place you could ever be to get a miracle and unlock faith in your life. So I want to stir your faith up for that today. Don't live in doubt. Don't live in fear. Live in the victory that Jesus is one for you on Calvary. I think you get around people in the church and they should like like spark. In fact, I hope I'm sparking you. I hope some of you are getting annoyed with me. I think we've got too much soft, woke, three points in a poem, Reader's Digest messages. And I think we need an anointing of the Holy Ghost and power 
that can unlock something in our spirit and cause men to rise up again and take the lead in their homes and take the lead in our pl- in our planet and start to lead people back into the Word of God and lead the home into the power of God's liberty in Jesus' name. And I'll tell you, it's the church because you hang around people in church and they kind of, they, it says iron sharpens iron. I don't know how that really works, to be honest with you. But I tell you what, when you rub up against people who've got a bit of the Holy Ghost on them, it will unsettle you, maybe rattle you a little. You could even get angry in here today. And I hope you do. I'd sooner go home angry than bored. And I'll tell you right, sometimes we need people that'll rub up against us a little bit and annoy us and shake us and rattle us out of our little cage a little bit. So I think it was Nipsey Hussle, the great, the, the, the famous rapper who stated this quote. He said, he said, if the circle of friends that you've got don't rattle you to live bigger than what you're living right now, you don't have a circle, you have a cage. And I think it's an incredible quote. And I think sometimes we need to adapt that into our world so that we're living a little bit, break out of the box and believe God's got the best yet is to come in Jesus' name. So even though it's dark, we're looking at the power of the Word of God in our lives. And I want to challenge you today, let's rise up and live there. The second thought I'd like to give you today, what are you carrying that would unleash the impossible? What are you carrying in your life? See, I think sometimes we carry nothing. This may be my last point. Some of you are looking a little bored. And, uh, but, uh, but what are you carrying? And I think, you know, David was carrying an entire nation, the anointing of a nation on his shoulder. Caleb and Joshua, 80 years old. Some of us get to 60 and we retire, 65 and we're half quitting on life. Man, Joshua and Caleb are 80 years old and they're carrying a dream and a vision to take a whole nation into the promised land. Come on, it's not over yet. We've got a whole, we've got a whole revival to happen in our nations. We need to shake the place up a little bit and grab a hold of a vision again. I don't care how old you are. God wants to refresh you today and inspire you to live again and dream again and go again in Jesus' name. And I think sometimes, what are you carrying? Abraham was carrying the fire. God said, go up on the mountain and sacrifice. And the Bible says he carried his own fire. Some people are carrying nothing. There's a desperate world out there waiting for you to turn up in their life. And they don't want you turning up empty-handed. They want you to turn up with something in your life. Something in your life that can change and rattle and turn their world upside down. I was in a supermarket the other day, just doing a bit of shopping. I was walking through the supermarket, saw this lady giving away some free cheese. Mark, you were with me. And we walked up there and started getting some, some of her free cheese. You know, it's good. Men love. That's why men love supermarkets. They should have that all over the supermarket. Free tasting. It's the only reason we go for. And so we're tasting this. And then we started talking to the lady. And, and what are you doing here? And I told her how I was in the city, particular city, to preach the gospel. And she said, where are you? And I told her the church. We said, she said, oh, my daughter goes to that church. And I said, well, do you go? And she says, no, no, we don't go to church. And I said, well, how do you know she's not in some cult or something? How do you know they're not wrecking a life? I said, you better come and check it out tonight and check out what we're delivering. Anyway, the mother and the father came to the meeting and, and uh, then next thing we have an altar call and they're giving their lives, they're weeping their hearts out on the altar because they've encountered the God of all ages, the God who can unlock the impossible. And the daughter, the daughter, Dominique, Dominique comes up and she's bawling. She ends up on the floor bawling because her mum and dad had got born again. A thing she thought was impossible. But with God, nothing is impossible because God is looking for an opportunity to unlock faith in your life. And here they were, wonderfully born again, wonderfully transformed by the love of God. And friends, I want to tell you right now, what are you carrying? Because if you're not carrying, if you turn up empty handed, what's the use of that? We need to turn up with the anointing of God on us. And I want to say right now, friend, wherever you are in this place, my last, I'll give you one final thought as I close today. And that is, we need to reposition our lives. I think sometimes we need some repositioning happen. God, I need to step back in to the center of your calling in my life. God, I need to step back into my purpose. God, I need to step back in to what you want to do through me for my world. God, I want to catch faith. I want to catch a spirit of faith. And incidentally, I believe it's better caught than taught. 
I think you catch a spirit of faith in an atmosphere of a church like this, a great church that has an incredible opportunity, great worship, incredible praise, and the Spirit of the Lord hovers around the angels inhabiting the praises. You can catch it out of the very atmosphere today and live in the victory of your anointing. So today, I want to say one final thought today. Why don't we shift into that place and reposition our lives and say, God, I am ready to attack things that are impossible in my life. God, I'm ready to rise above my fears, above being intimidated. God, I will no longer dwell in the land of fear, but I'm going to live in the realm of supernatural opportunity. I'm stepping out of where I am. I'm going to reposition my life. I'm coming into line with God. Moses, he saw the burning bush and the Bible says he stepped aside from where he was and stood in front of God's holy fire and God's word and God appointed him exactly what his next step should be to deliver an entire nation. Who knows in this place today there's not people here that will bring deliverance to the entire of the Sunshine Coast. Who knows whether there's not national national revivalists in this place today. Evangelists that'll see schools turned upside down. That'll see the power of God erupt our universities and turn them back to Jesus. Who knows who's in this place but friend, sometimes we need to step aside side and say, God, we're going to surrender and focus on you again. And I want to pray for you today as we close. And I want to believe God. So Father, I thank you right now for the word of God today. I thank you for a spirit of faith that's in this place that would pull us into a place of expectation today. God, I pray for every person here who's suffering or God who's broken. God may be shackled by the the cares and the hurt and the pain of this world. God, I pray for miracles in them today. In Port Moresby right now, God, I believe for a supernatural miracle to happen in the lives of every person in that meeting today. Across the airwaves right now, we declare that this is a holy moment and we praise you today, God, for the miracles that will follow. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody shouted, Amen.